Welcome to the last session of the last day. Uh, thanks for sticking around a little bit. Um, I'm, a, I'm actually a math and science teacher. I've told several of you that. Ask, you know, what am I, what, what's my work? What do I do in agroforestry? And, and the answer is, is um, it's really a hobby at this point. Um, I, I did just complete the online master's program at the University of Missouri, and I, I really did that uh, for fun. I started taking courses and, and just kept going because it was a program. So I, uh, I really uh, speak highly of that program and think highly of the program because I think it's, it's wonderful. And uh, this topic is, was the last paper that I wrote uh, and defended just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I presented it kind of on a whim to the conference. Um, uh, so dynamic mineral accumulation. So um, dynamic accumulators, of course, uh, in, in permaculture literature, and I'll be honest, I was surprised when I came here that um, in the last couple of days to hear so many people talking about permaculture and dynamic accumulators and things like, oh wow, I, I, I really didn't expect that. Uh, so a lot of people um, uh, that were here for the, for the week and are here now uh, know that the dynamic accumulators, uh, this is the definition from Robert Couric um, who wrote that plants, uh, that these are plants that amass a greater amount uh, than usual of a particular nutrient. So they accumulate nutrients from uh, deeper in the soil stra uh, substrata and bring those nutrients um, to the soil surface. Um, and, in, and for years and in continuing now, um, um, uh, many writers of these popular books in, in um, forest gardening or permaculture um, advocate using these accumulators, these specific plants, to, to aid in nutrient cycling in our systems. Uh, here's an example of uh, just an excerpt from um, some of you are familiar with this book. Uh, so uh, this has been referenced a couple of different times uh, uh, even today uh, from Dave Jackie's book uh, on um, edible forest gardens. Just uh, an example of the list. So here are some, here are some plants uh, that, that a lot of us know on common names. And then, and then here are the nutrients uh, that the authors uh, claim that these, um, that these specific plants take up. Um, but uh, so so the reasoning, of course, I, know I mentioned this earlier, is that, is that if we planted these accumulators near our key uh, species, such as a fruit or nut tree, that, that we could get the, uh, the benefit of having these, um, these plants uh, bring up the nutrients to the soil surface, uh, deposit those with, with litter fall, leaf fall, um, and then uh, the, the, the tree and nut species could have access uh, to these nutrients. Um, but then uh, recently, and I'll, I'll share a couple quotations with you in a second, uh, some of the authors who wrote the books, including Dave Jackie, uh, um, have, you know, not, not necessarily too publicly, but have questioned, you know, really, is there any research that shows that that actually happens? Uh, it sounds great, um, and, and it would be great if it really does happen, but where is the research on this? Um, and, and so Dave Jackie wrote, I, I wrote a, um, a, f a paper for one of the courses at Missouri, and uh, it was published in um, The Overstory. Uh, maybe some of you know that. It's the online agroforestry journal. And Craig Elovich sent the paper to Dave Jackie. And this is a comment that he wrote back to Craig, who sent it to me. This is d directly out of the email that I received from Dave Jackie, um, and I had referenced his book. And th really, the reason I referenced his book is I couldn't find anything, um, at least in that survey, I couldn't find anything in the literature um, uh, in, in the peer-reviewed uh, journal articles that, about dynamic accumulation. So I used Dave Jackie's book. And um, he said, well, even Robert Couric um, uh, may be sorry that uh, he, he says propagated uh, or, and promulgated uh, this idea of dynamic accumulators. Um, and he said, there's not very good research to back up that particular idea. I agree with him. Um, and then uh, recently, I just ran across this. Some of you may know the uh, uh, kind of a, a, a website, uh, temperate, um, temperate Permaculture by John Kitsteiner, um, uh, who's a medical doctor and got into the, this area just uh, as a passion. And he was writing on dynamic accumulators, kind of doing the same thing that I was thinking about doing um, in, in looking into, well, is there any research? And he says, I can find no research into this concept um, at all. That's, again, straight out of the, off the website, but that's a typo. Um, none. As it turns out, it appears that the concept has been passed down, that it's been accepted as fact, and he's basically saying there is, there's no research showing that. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I ran across this just a couple of weeks ago, just um, reading a uh, territorial seed catalog. This was, um, I wasn't even looking for it, but um, uh, so this idea still definitely exists in the popular literature. Uh, even a seed catalog, a seed company is saying that um, uh, these, uh, these dynamic accumulators, they don't call them that. They, they bring up 
minerals to the surface for other plants to utilize. So they're, they're describing exactly dynamic mineral accumulation. Uh, and then, and again, again, we continue to use this idea, even though maybe not, there, there's, there's not much research or, or any to, to back up that idea. Um, I came to this topic as a gardener uh, years and years ago. Uh, well, to me, uh, I'd say 10 years ago or so, I uh, started learning about permaculture. And then I created this, uh, this forest garden uh, on a, a very modest, about 1,500 square feet. Uh, I just packed in the plants. I had 120 or 130 different species in there just, just really playing around. Uh, and this was totally for fun. Uh, I've actually since abandoned this site, uh, not because I wanted to, but because um, I told you I teach at the Asheville School. They actually own the property that I live on, which is both good and bad. They, they sold this. Uh, so, but I went down there to take these pictures, uh, and uh, I, even though I hadn't been there in two years, I've done no management of it. This, this forest garden still just humming along, actually doing really, really well without me. Um, which is not much of a surprise. Uh, here you can see, it's hard to see what's going on here, but the, here's some hazelnuts. Uh, there's, a, there's a Japanese plum in the background. Lots and lots of uh, herbaceous species. Uh, many of them that I chose, uh, specifically because they were said to be, in, in, in these popular books, uh, dynamic accumulators. Um, you know, I, I've been for years uh, inspired by the words. I've seen J. Russell Smith's, uh, you know, words used over and over just, just today even, a million hills green uh, with crop yielding trees. Um, here's another little example of another kind of small installation I have on the Asheville School Campus uh, with a, um, uh, a fruit tree and, and some uh, purported dynamic accumulator. So then, then of course, my question is, uh, starting looking into the literature, into the peer review uh, journal or, uh, journals, is, does, it, does it exist? Is it actually, is there research uh, that shows that this uh, phenomenon actually occurs? Um, and so, uh, and it is true what Jackie wrote to me indirectly a couple of years ago. It's, it's, there's not a whole lot of research. Uh, and there's certainly, uh, if, you, uh, if you just keyword agroforestry, dynamic accumulators, you get nothing, zero. I mean, there is nothing out there um, about that. But as I kept digging and, and, and talking with my advisor, Shibu Jose, uh, you know, giving me, giving me some ideas. Uh, um, I find several peer-reviewed journal articles uh, not specifically doing this thing that we're talking about as permaculturalists and as multi-strata home gardeners or forest gardeners, but um, there is research, excuse me, there is research that shows that um, sun plants do indeed preferentially take up certain key nutrients that we're interested in as, as, as growers of fruit and uh, nut tree crops and uh, the land on. Um, I will say that uh, one can certainly find um, uh, a lot of research on hyperaccumulation, especially uh, say of toxic metals in phytoremediation, phytomining type studies. There, there's a lot of that out there, um, but I'm talking about specifically these uh, herbaceous species mostly grown for this specific specific application. So again, my conclusion is there is yeah. research. It actually does, there is research that this uh, phenomenon does actually occur. So let's look at a few of the summaries, um, uh, some of the research, starting with first um, some hydroponically uh, grown um, uh, species. Uh, these were uh, fertilized with prepared nutrient solutions. Um, and the authors uh, of this, um, I'll show you some data in a second, but uh, to summarize, they found that there's a significant variation between orders for these um, uh, nutrients, calcium, potassium, magnesium, uh, no significant variation between orders in terms of nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, and and uh, really overall, they're, they're, um, they, they suggest that significant variation uh, in shoot mineral concentration can be found at the species level. Uh, just a little bit of a, a but I quick summary of, of the work. There's, there's certainly a lot more data in, uh, in the article. Um, uh, here would be the mean for these different nutrients. Here's the mean. I could not find actually a, a variation of standard deviation, but uh, here's a mean of these um, key nutrients, some of these key nutrients. And then I just list here some highest species concentrations. Um, so, I mean, you know, as I, I'm an applied statistician, I teach applied statistics, and, and I mean, it just makes sense. They're, all of the species aren't going to have the same concentrations. I mean, there has to be a distribution. So high, how wide is the distribution? Uh, and it turns out, in, in for some of these nutrients, it's actually fairly wide. Um, uh, I'll just take uh, one here. Borage, um, it's listed in some of the texts as being a, um, a dynamic accumulator. Uh, if you're interested in 
in, in potassium. The mean was around 4.9 percent. Borage was the highest at 9.2 percent. Again, I don't know exactly what the, how far away from the mean that is, but, but a, a pretty drastic difference. Of course, there is species variations. And again, these were, in, um, uh, these were under controlled conditions. Uh, so, so right away we see the first, you know, w one of the first articles I found said, yep, it, it's actually occurring, that, that these species are, that plants do take up nutrients uh, preferentially. Um, so um, here's uh, then the next level, so then, then some, um, some uh, trials on, uh, in soils. Uh, these were, uh, this was in northwest uh, Russia, uh, greenhouse trials, but again uh, with soils, uh, again uh, controlled conditions. Um, and they found that, that nutrient concentrations did certainly vary significantly by, by species um, um, based on the genetic capability of particular plant spe species for uptaking, uh, taking up those, those different nutrients. Um, here's just a quick summary again. Um, and they, they, lo they were looking at kind of the di dichotomy between uh, monocots and dicots and found that, um, that there's certainly variation. Um, uh, one of the uh, uh, dicots, uh, calcium in general, the calcium uptake of dicots would be uh, significantly higher, they found, um, than, in the, than the monocots. Um, so again, some, some, um, some research showing that, yes, this phenomenon does occur. Uh, so now we move to uh, the next level, and uh, this was a field study done in, in England, of course, a, a temperate zone. Um, this was, uh, there were 83 different species, uh, several hundred uh, specimens in, uh, in total. Um, and they found, these authors found, and I'll show some data in a minute, uh, they found that um, very similar to the first, um, uh, the, 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 the first uh, study I, I showed just a second ago that um, phosphorus and, and nitrogen concentrations were uh, species level traits. Uh, that calcium and magnesium um, were at the uh, order level or higher and that, uh, that potassium somewhere in the middle. So, so again, very similar to some earlier um, uh, research showing uh, uh, in, uh, in controlled uh, conditions. And I, this is a little misleading. I, I put this on here after yesterday's uh, tour. Uh, they did not have milkweed species uh, in this study. But, but to, to give an example, so these, of course, um, here are two milkweed species, a common milkweed and, um, and the butterfly weed. Uh, these, would be, these would be predicted by, by this research to have, uh, being of the same order, similar calcium, magnesium, and perhaps uh, uh, potassium concentrations, but they could have, and again, uh, I'm just kind of trying to tie it into what we've seen here, um, uh, they could have, uh, based on this modeling or the, these, uh, this empirical research, uh, different phosphorus and, and nitrogen concentrations. Um, some, some of the classic accumulators, um, I, so I, what I try to do is look at, at say, Jackie's work, um, one of the more popular books in this area uh, in, in the United States um, on uh, forest gardening, um, multi-strata home gardening, and you know, some of the classic accumulators, the ones that, that were found in the Thompson Field Study in, in England. Uh, there were a few. I pull out uh, a couple of them, the stinging nettles, chickweed, and comfrey. Um, actually, the comfrey was not found in that study, but the, the, the first two. So here are the ones that Jackie and, and Tonsmeyer say that um, these are the nutrients that these plants uh, take up, uh, supposedly. So then we look at what data I could find from the Thompson study, the field study in England. Um, so this is a summary table. This shows the mean level for um, a couple hundred specimens, uh, the 83 different species. This is the mean level. Again, uh, really difficult to find um, uh, variation uh, when it's just given in a, in a journal article. Um, but uh, here's the urtica. I put in yellow the, the two different um, uh, nutrients that they're supposed to, that uh, nettles are supposed to take up preferentially higher and higher amounts. Um, and, and we see actually it, it's not quite as clean as, as we would hope is that um, uh, the nettles, uh, there were several different specimens uh, of nettles here. This is the average. Um, but for potassium, it's actually lower than average. Um, but then for calcium, um, it was much higher than, than average. So, so you know, 50-50 there. So uh, one thing I've, uh, from my just review of the literature, I, I see that it's not as clean as we'd like it to be. That, that, that if you want to take up this nutrient, you don't necessarily plant only this plant, because it may not be that. Um, uh, one more example, um, uh, chickweed, common here, well, at least common where I live in, in North Carolina. Um, it was supposed to, it's supposed to take up uh, potassium at a high level, and in fact, it was, it was the highest level of the, the entire study. Uh, so, so that one worked out, 6.59% um, um, 
uh, as compared to the mean, um, and, and much higher phosphorus as well. Uh, the comfrey here, so uh, I mean, I, this is, uh, I apologize, I, I couldn't find, this was actually a study done years ago. I've heard here at the conference that there's been a recent, more, a couple years ago, study on comfrey. Uh, I did not find that for this review, um, but this was done years ago, I think at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and I'm comparing, I'm just giving the numbers that, was given, that were given in that um, study compared to the field study done in England. So we're talking about two totally different areas. I just wanted to, to put some numbers here to show, um, so the Comfrey um, did have, again, compared to the, the, the mean uh, for, for England uh, for that field study, it did have higher phosphorus uh, and potassium, but just a little bit higher calcium and, and about average magnesium. Um, so for just some words from, uh, from the study. Um, uh, th these authors suggest that species with relatively, uh, with re relatively nutrient-rich or poor leaves on one substrate also tend to be nutrient-rich or poor on all other substrates, uh, irrespective of soil pH, um, altitude, land use. Um, so, I mean, what that says is, is some people would say, well, are these plants just growing where they can grow? Um, and, and they concluded from looking at, and I'm going to show a little bit more analysis of my own of their data, um, that's, that, that, yeah, that, that does happen sometimes, I guess, um, that, that some plants are growing because they can grow there. Uh, but this research, uh, the, these um, uh, researchers are suggesting that not exactly, that, that a plant, uh, let's say chickweed that takes up calcium at a high level, will do it in most places uh, compared to um, other, other species, which is what we're looking for if we're using these types of plants in our um, agroforestry systems. Um, so that so that I, you know, I summarize, they, they don't simply have higher mineral nutrient accumulations because they grow only in soils. That these actually do take up these nutrients preferentially, um, really no matter where they are. Um, so then I, I just, this is my own analysis of just a little bit of their data. Um, so in terms of calcium, just taking one of the, uh, of the mineral nutrients that we're interested in. So uh, of course, calcium uptake would be, um, would be influenced by pH. Uh, the lower the pH, the, the, the lower the calcium uptake. Uh, so I just looked at, um, uh, and they had uh, species all the way from in the fours to um, up near eight in, in terms of pH. So I just looked between six and 6.0 and 6.99. Let's just take those species of plants um, and, and, and uh, just look at a plot of pH versus uh, uh, the percent calcium. And you can see here there, there, is, there is no relationship, no statistical relationship at all in that range. Um, and certainly if we looked at a, in a, at a wider uh, range of pH, we could probably see that relationship. But what you do see from the graphic is what we're talking about here is that some plants um, take up calcium uh, at a much higher level regardless of the pH. So uh, we're, com we're comparing here, just look at around 6.7, we have all the way from 0.25 all the way over, you know, closer to four. So, so I mean, there could be other factors here, but certainly it's not just, um, it, it's, it, it really has nothing to do with pH here, it appears. Um, and, and that's just another way of looking at the data. So um, this would be those samples that I pulled just in this range, six to 6.99, in uh, just a, a simple box plot uh, showing the median uh, here at 1.5, and then showing, you know, the, um, uh, I think it was, uh, Earlier, we saw um, that the, uh, the stinging nettles had the higher, that was the, the, the maximum there at almost uh, 4%. So, I mean, the bottom line is I, I think there, there is research showing that this phenomenon does exist. And um, uh, we've seen it, uh, we, we see it in these um, herbaceous species. Uh, I'm going to bypass this one. Uh, this was a study done in Australia, but so showing similar things, uh, similar results that, that they found that, that there are certain plants, uh, certain plant families that take up. Uh, new, different types of nutrients um, uh, preferentially. Um, so just further uh, supporting uh, what we've always, what we've used for a long time in, in permaculture. Um, and then finally, this one was, uh, this was done, this was a, um, a tree species, uh, flowering dogwood. Uh, it shows uh, the relationship between um, uh, the uh, stems per hectare, uh, the, the density versus soil calcium saturation in, in the new, um, the authors here, Shibu Jose was one of the authors of this one, showing they, they, they state that, um, that this species may play an important role in nutrient cycling by acting as a pump, so dynamically accumulating this nutrient in its leaves um, and then dispersing that uh, nutrient for other, other plant species to use. 
Um, so uh, uh, Dr. Nair wrote this um, in 1993 that some tree and shrub species can selectively accumulate certain nutrients even in soils which contain very small amounts of these nutrients and, and what I conclude uh, from, from my um, review of the literature is, is even though there's not a lot of literature out there, there is evidence um, that the same can be said for herbaceous species that we often um, are using in agroforestry systems, small scale, especially uh, as dynamic accumulators to help in um, mineral cycling. Um, certainly, you know, there's a lot of a lot of questions that I have. Welcome them to have about this is, well, what are the native species in North America that that can be used, um, and then what nu nutrients do these take up uh, in our soils? Um, uh, what are the biodiversity considerations if we use these plants in our um, agroforestry systems, even larger scale? As I mentioned here, how do we use these, or can these be used in in uh, in um, agroforestry practices? Uh, certainly. We have uh, issues of interspecies interactions and competition. If we're planting a comfrey beside an apple tree, does it, I mean, what are the interactions? So what is going on there um, uh, to, to help and hinder the, uh, the, the prize uh, fruit or nut uh, tree? And then the economics of it, um, if, you're, if you're putting in plants, buying plants, propagating plants, putting in plants for this specific purposes, is it cost effective? Um, but again, I mean, I, I do conclude that, that, that there is evidence that this is actually happening as we've, we've been learning about in some of the popular texts for a long time. Okay. Questions? Thank you. Yeah. Those plots that you had where you showed the relative uh, nutrient concentrations across the pH range that you showed there, was that a group of, of species or was that an individual species? Oh, that was just all of the plant species in that. All of that. I was just trying to show. They, they, they had, um, let me think, you know, I think five or six different specimens of each of, say, um, 20 different uh, species. Actually, some of them, they only had one or two. But that was just a bunch of different, uh, a bunch of different species shown there. They didn't give that data in the study. It was at, there was a mean at a table with the, if they had five specimens, it was just the mean level for that particular. There was variation, um, I think they mentioned, but, but they don't, I, I didn't see the actual data for the individual specimens taken. Yeah, please. Uh, do you have, what would be a good experimental design to kind of really test this out? Um, so to, I guess, um, would you kind of look at baselines of nutrients in the soil and then plant plants and see, let that go for a long time and see how that changes? Or what do you think, where do you think the research kind of needs to go to really solidify this point? Well, I mean, I think, you know, side by side, block, you know, so the, the side by side comparisons of the, the nutrient content in the leaves, um, I, I mean, I think that would be just a fairly straightforward um, block design that, that could take place with a bunch of different, I, I think, you know, key species for, for North America. Yeah. You know, one of the challenges, or not challenges, just to, to figure out what species we, we would like to study. And personally, I mean, I, though I have a lot of non-native species, I mean, I'd really, I mean, uh, over the years, I've more and more wanted to go towards the, the native species to even, not necessarily even North America, but specifically to my region. So, so I think, um, you know, look, just choosing the key species that we'd like to study. Yeah. I, I would say, too, a practitioner, what would you recommend until we do have more data on all of the exact concentrations, which, do you have any suggestions based on your experience? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I say, well, I think grow a lot of different, yeah, run a lot of these plants out there. I think, you know, it, depending on, you know, if we're looking at a larger scale when we're talking about the economics of it, I'm not worried about the economics as a, you know, home gardener. I'm just, uh, I, I, I'm not at all, you know, worried about that. So um, I like to plant a bunch of different types of, of uh, of these species and, and see what happens, you know, just as, as a practitioner, which is what you're asking. I mean, anecdotally, it's working really well. I mean, I've seen tremendous growth in these trees with absolutely no watering, no uh, additional fertilizer, nothing else besides these plants 
growing, um, the, these specific types of plants growing beside the, the fruit and nut trees. And, and again, after two years of abandonment, I went down to the forest garden and it's just, I mean, it's just really doing well. It looked as it beautiful and looked really healthy, a little perhaps, but what but, but was doing great. So I say plant, you know, try a lot of these and, and see what works. Um, uh, anecdotally, for me as a practitioner, I mean, I, I, feel, I feel like I've seen that it does work and I, I mean, I feel like it does in, in the research showing, it. yeah, it does. It's, don't try to specific, uh, choose one specific plant for one specific mineral concentration, you know, improvement. Yeah. I'm sorry? No, I haven't. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, uh, uh, I haven't. I know the, uh, that plant, but I haven't worked with it, no. Yeah, right. Yeah, please. Um, a grad student at the University of Minnesota did some research on that, and I'm sure that if you do a lit search, you'll find uh, numerous deer and species. And I can't report on off the top of my head the results, but I remember she was very disappointed that it didn't do what she hoped it would do. <laughs> hmm. Right. A lot of the brassicas hyperaccumulate everything. Yeah. Um, which is weird because they are one of the few uh, families that don't have uh, very many fungal um, as root associations. So uh, I don't know if you're done with this pro project, but it might be interesting to look at the like invasive literature on. Right. I am finished with this project just for the, just for, for the, uh, uh, not not as a, on a as a practitioner, but I, I think research-wise, I'm probably going to move away from this. But um, yeah, the brassicas have been. Uh, you mentioned this, uh, but uh, it was on my slide. I don't think I mentioned, but brassicas as a family would very uh, high mineral con uh, concentrations of a lot of the different nutrients that we're interested in. Sure. And I think this is great to acknowledge the phenomenon existing as far as selective and sort of different relationships of plants to soil. There's also the piece of if that nutrient's in the soil to begin with. So there's not enough calcium in the soil and it could delineate. And I was a little confused. I guess my question is about um, one of the studies you were talking about was implying that regardless of where the, the plants are going to accumulate to that certain amount? No, I, I think what they were saying is if you put, uh, if you put um, a chickweed beside another plant, that the chickweed, even though the calcium level wouldn't be that high, it would still have a higher concentration of the other plant. So, so not necessarily achieving that level. It's still going to do, in poor soils, it'll still accumulate at a higher uh, level than, than, a similar, uh, than other plants that are planted in the same soil. Okay. But if there was zero calcium, there would be? Yeah, zero calcium, there's probably going to, but, but I, don't, I mean, yeah. Uh, in most of the soils that I'm familiar with, there's at least some, some calcium. Yeah. So I guess my only feedback would be to, to encourage you to, to, and everyone to put out there that the phenomenon exists of certain plants accumulating nutrients at different percentages, and there's lots of dynamic, <laughs> contextual pieces to consider. Absolutely. So, and it seems like there's more research needing to be cautious about the list that exists out there, because as you showed, and I really appreciate that, we actually dig down into the data, we shouldn't just assume that because it accumulates one nutrient, well, it's, it's you know, because some of those may not be statistically significant in terms of how much more they accumulate. Yeah, right. So I think that, that's great to see that comparison. I really appreciate you digging into that. 
I think that's what Dave Jackie was saying that he was kind of ashamed of in a way as an author that he put that table out as specific as it was. Uh, and it was much more extensive than the little excerpt that I showed, but, but that it's, it's really not as straightforward as that, that this, this plant takes up this nutrient all the time in every situation, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all.